Cavalcade of America. Just as traditions of American character have grown up with our people, so the DuPont Company has grown with the nation to occupy an increasingly useful place in our economic life. DuPont presents the Cavalcade of America in the belief that the stories of peace and courage you will hear on these programs represent a heritage too precious to be forgotten. These are true episodes brought to light by the careful search of distinguished educators and historians prominent in the American Historical Association. Today as ever, America carries its tradition forward, driving through to new accomplishments, so well exemplified by the research of DuPont chemists in creating better things for better living through chemistry. In every chemistry, in every walk of life, this spirit of get ahead, this desire for constant improvement, has always inspired and will continue to inspire the cavalcade of America. We set our stage tonight for the year 1889 with some melodies that were popular in the gay 90s, played by the Cavalcade Orchestra. What trait is more American than the spirit of healthy competition? Friendly rivalry has done much to advance our nation's progress. In every walk of life, we find the urge to succeed, to advance, to conquer difficulties and opposition often spurs us to win where praise softens and brings self-satisfaction. Our nation's history has many examples of contests out of which came advancement and improvement. But tonight, we are concerned with but two. The paths of empire are leading westward. New territories are opening. Broader horizons are stretching before an eager nation. In her sister's home, Mrs. Molly Nesbitt is reading a recent copy of a St. Louis paper. Anna, Charles, look here. What is it? Somebody dead? The president. President Harrison. Dead? No, no, why, of course oh. not. He's issued a proclamation. Oh, is that all? Hmm. 
the way you acted, I thought heaven Indian knows. territory is to be opened up at last, made part of the, oh, what do you call it, the public domain. I saw something about that a few weeks ago in the paper. Now that you speak of it. And you never told me. Well, Congress ratifies so many bills. Two million acres of land to be given away. Mm, well, why anybody'd want to take up land in the wilderness like that? Isn't why? It? For a home, of course. For a living. A fresh start. For... Oh, I suppose there are folks, but thousands of them. Land-hungry folks who've been waiting years for the chance. John always said it would come, that it was bound to come. If only he could have lived to see it. But at last it's happened. The government's bought the land from the Indians. It's to be open for settlement. 160 acres to a person. I know the very spot I'll claim. You? You'll claim? Yes. What are you talking about? Well, I'm going to join the run and stake a homestead. Why, well, Molly. Molly? I've been waiting for this day for years. The day when I could get land, land of my own, for myself and my children. You've got a home here with Anna and me as long as you live, Molly. I'm you know that. I know, and I don't want you to think I'm ungrateful. But a home of my own is what I want, and here's a chance to get it. Well, now, Molly, we'll see. We'll just think it over a while. There's and... no time to lose in thinking it over. The President's proclamation was issued three days ago. The land will be opened in less than a month. Hundreds of folks are on the road already, most likely. On the road? Uh, heading for the line. You mean you have to go there? <laughs> of course. What do you suppose? Oh, I, I thought you sent in an application or something. Well, you don't ask for a section of land. You go and stake it out. Oh. If you can get it. If you can get it, yes. Two million acres and 50,000 folks may be after it. Yeah, more likely 100,000. Then what chance have you Everybody's got? Everybody's got an even chance. They aren't letting anyone across the line beforehand. Not a day, nor an hour, not even a minute. A lot of them will slip in ahead of time just the same. Well, they'll be disqualified if they do. See, it says so right here in the paper. Well, will, will everybody line up at the border? And wait for the hour, yes. The signal to start. It'll be a race. Every man for himself. Molly Ness, but you don't really mean you're going to join that rush. What chance would you have against a bunch of hard riding land grabbers? Of course. Best in the world. Because I know just the place John always hoped to stake out for us someday. You follow an old freighter's trail. There's a grove of cottonwoods and a little creek and some rolling hills. Oh, I could head right for it. On foot, I suppose. Or on horseback or in a wagon. I'll find some way. <laughs> the country they came, a hundred thousand people, in trains, in wagons, in buggies, on horseback and on muleback, in ox carts and in prairie schooners, on foot even, a crazy heterogeneous procession, pushing, scrambling, cursing, laughing, eager to get to the line. Once there, they waited, for days, some of them, under a burning sun, amid choking red dust, no place to rest, nothing much to eat, even less to drink waiting for the hour when the land would be open. In the midst of this mad milling crowd was Molly Nesbitt. Back! Keep back, everybody! Well, oh, Ginger, hold quiet, boy, quiet. You making the run, ma'am, or just watching? I'm going in. With your husband? No, nope, alone. <laughs> You've got nerve. Well, I got a good heart. You're right. You can't beat an Indian pony for endurance and over rough ground. Now, that fellow over yonder with the black mare... He won't be in it with you and me. No? That's a racetrack horse he's got. Oh. Trained for short spurts. Watermelons! Ripe watermelons! Well, watermelons! A farmer with a whole cartload of them, by gosh. Yeah, and they're going fast. Uh, come on, let's try and get one. Oh, I, I don't dare to leave. I, I fought all night to keep this place right in front. Well, you stay here and I'll go all there. Right. Watermelons! Ripe watermelons! Get up. Come on, get in there, Jerry. Well, what the place is... You can't push your team in here. That's my place. Yeah, your place is back home, lady, tending to your knitting. Well, this run's open to all comers, isn't it? I've got just as much right here as anybody. Well, I hope you're a good rider. I am. Because if you ain't, there's no telling. Let that pony of yours stumble in a coyote hole and the rest of this thunder in the herd will ride right over you. Trample on you. You ever seen a cattle stampede? <laughs> yes. Well, it's going to be ten times worse. Because they're not running blind. They're all after something. Well, they're human beings, though. Yep. Huh. Is this noise sound human to you? They are herd of wild animals, I tell you, penned up, raring to go. And just cause you're a woman, I'm don't... not asking any favors or giving any. This is my place here in the line. Yes, that's 
Eleven bucks. Got one. I got one. I, uh, I got a piece of watermelon anyway. Oh. I paid a dollar for it at that. Yeah. Kind of warm, I'm afraid, but it's juicy. Here, oh, take uh, some. Uh, oh, I couldn't. I. Go on. Oh no, uh, there's only enough for one. You eat it. Save four anyway. Think I'm going to guzzle watermelon while you stand there with your tongue hanging out and your lips all cracked and dry? <laughs> Here, take half. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hits the spot, don't it? Mm. You know, I, I could bury my whole face in it. My eyes. And... <laughs> yeah, yeah, my eyes smart, too, like fury. It's all that brush smoke where they've burned the prairie ahead of us. Yeah, they did it to clear the way for us, I suppose. Yeah, and the smoke out the Sooners. What? Uh, the Sooners. The fellows who thought they'd sneak in sooner, ahead of time, and hide in the scrub. Oh. It's that some has managed to get in. Got their claims all staked out by now, most likely. Oh, but there's a penalty. Sure. Oh, there'll be plenty of arguments and shooting and lawsuits. Hey, say, you see that fellow yonder in the spring wagon? Yeah. He's a lawyer. They're getting in on the ground floor. Oh, then, uh, then they're not all going in for land. No. Some are making for the town site. Merchants, builders, saloon keepers. <laughs> <laughs> a, a jackrabbit just run out across the line. <laughs> yeah, calling him a sooner. A good thing, something to make him laugh and relieve the strain. Yeah. Back, everybody. Keep back. Only a few minutes now. Hey, you better mount your pony, ma'am. Be ready. All right. The militia's all got their watches out and their guns. Ready to give the signal. Well, how can we ever hear over all this noise? What? Why, there isn't any noise. Have I have I gone deaf all of a sudden? They're listening for the signal. It's almost noon. Yes. Oh, boy. Oh, Competition and civilization, rivalry and progress. This spirit has always been strong in the heart of the American people. It changed the country from a wilderness to a land of hope. Even before the Oklahoma land rush, the roots of American love of competition led back to an incident which caused excitement throughout the civilized world. Our cavalcade orchestra takes up the Mississippi and the days of 1870 with an excerpt from Fray Grosset's Mississippi Sweep.
is the year 1870. Down the brown waters of the Mississippi steams the Robert E. Lee, loaded with cotton for New Orleans. Captain John W. Cannon, owner and commander of the mighty packet, stands on a hurricane deck talking with one of his passengers. Here in uh, Baton Rouge, are we? Be there in about 20 minutes now. Making good time this trip, Captain. And the Robert E. Lee makes good time every trip. Isn't a boat on the river can beat us. <laughs> yeah, you talk just like Captain Leathers of the Natchez. Leathers? That wind bag. <laughs> the loud mouth brass thing. Yeah, here now, Captain, what you say, Captain. Tom Leathers happens to be a good friend of mine. Yeah, travel on his boat then, why don't you? Well, I did come up on the Natchez. You happen to be a good friend of mine, too. So I reckon I'd travel back on the lee. <clears throat> well, uh, uh, what do you think of the Natchez? A huh? beautiful boat. Prettiest lines I think I ever saw. Yeah, handsome is as handsome does. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Natchez can do plenty. Leathers claims she's the fastest boat on the Mississippi. And I don't know He's but... He's a liar. The Robert E. Lee's got them all. <laughs> Uh, Dad, here comes the Natchez now. How do you know it's her? <laughs> Think I don't recognize that whistle? She was still in Vicksburg loading when we pulled out. She must have done some mighty fast traveling to overtake us. Well, we've made a lot of stops this trip. Here she comes round the bend. You're right. It is the Natchez. Pretty, isn't she? Given along there. As white and graceful as a... A bride. A bride. <laughs> hey, Sam. Sam. Yes, Go below and tell Charlie to speed up a bit. Yes, sir. Captain Cannon, you're not going to do any racing. Oh, don't worry, ma'am. I'm scared to death of these boats. Uh, we're not going to do any racing, ma'am. I, uh, well, you see, we just wanted to get out of the way of the match. She, uh, she's gaining on us, Captain. Blasted, why don't Charlie pile on the wood and... She's pouring up on her, Jim. Go a little faster, Captain. No, you, you mustn't let her pass it. Well, I thought you was the one who just said that. Yes, I, I know, but I... Well, it's all right with me if you speed up a little. I, I can't bear to see that other boot get ahead of us. Fine. Please, Captain, don't Captain. Charlie. Charlie says we're making all the speed we can, sir, with the fuel we got. Carnation. Well, we're taking our more Baton Rouge, sir. Baton Rouge? I want it now. Oh, sorry, sir, but we're doing the all best. All right, all right. Last old leather. <laughs> you can't hardly blame him for wanting to show off with a brand new, beautiful boat. Well, he's done it with every boat he ever had. Way back in 55, when he had the first Natchez, and I had the old Lee. Oh, oh no. Nah, it's a nah, favorite he... trick of his. <laughs> sneaking up and then swooping back. From this challenge came the race which attracted nationwide, worldwide interest. The race between the Natchez and the Robert E. Lee. Enormous sums were wagered, not only in the river cities, but in large cities all over the United States, Canada, Mexico, Great Britain, and Europe. Late afternoon, June 30th, 1870. The levee at New Orleans is thronged with people eagerly awaiting the start. <laughs> Well, I went down to New Orleans 
I'm betting on the lead. Five hundred dollars that the Natchez will beat her. Don't. Bravo, man, I mean. Fancy the boat that bears the honored name of our general. Fancy <laughs> the boat with the best machinery, say I. Yes, the Lee is only four years old. And she's bigger. She looks bigger because she's wider and rises higher out of the water. But actually, she's not as big. Her name's always the biggest in the world. <laughs> you southerners are always loyal. They're about to start. Look, the Lee is backing out. Oh, what would I give to be aboard her? Oh, not for love or money. Could you or anybody else get passage on her? Captain Tanner refused positively to take any passengers or cargo. Naturally. He needs the room for fuel. What's he burning? Wood or coal? Both, I understand. He's got a big supply of things on hand for, for extra speed. Rosin, pitch, tallow, candles. She's a beauty. The Lee has dignity. <laughs> the Lee looks as if a cyclone had struck her. Even her wheelhouse is removed. Uh, Captain Cannon has made thorough preparations. <laughs> and Captain Leathers has made practically none. He's even carrying a cargo and passengers. And still he wins. Another 500 on the Robert E. Lee. Take him. They've rounded to the... Now! They're off! <laughs> Johnny Hawkins' famous saloon on the corner of Common Street and Riotous Alley, New Orleans. Hundreds waited all night for news. The Lee was leading at 24 mile point, ahead by 4 minutes and 40 seconds. She won't hold the lead long once old Leathers begins to let the matches out. Telegram for bad news. The Robert E. Lee passed there. Following morning, July 1st, in a Creole home. Which one you betting on, Miss Lucy? The Natchez, Manda. Why, Miss Lucy? I know. But the Natchez was the boat Mr. John and I took our honeymoon trip on. Lordy, so she was, Miss Lucy. And you're betting on the Robert E. Lee, Manda? How you get there? Uh, Moses is a roustabout on the knee, isn't he? <laughs> he sure is, ma'am. And that good for nothing dog, he tells me. Miss Lucy. Yes, Sam, what is it? Uh, just put a bulletin up down at the square. The Robert E. Lee breaks all records to the town of Natchez in 17 hours and 11 minutes. Glory be! <laughs> New York Stock Exchange House on the morning of July 2nd. What's the latest on the board, Frank? Well, Consolidated is selling oh, it. Oh, you say the Consolidated? Who's ahead in the race? The Robert E. Lee, sir. He passed Memphis, sir, at 10 minutes past 11. All business has been suspended for the day. I told you the Lee would win. Don't be too sure. Well, the race isn't half over yet. Well, the Lee's gaining all the time, though. She'll win by an hour. She's got an unfair advantage, having attended a fueler in midstream. <laughs> He's got a smart cat. Well, a thousand dollars that the Natchez will reach St. Louis first. Take it. <laughs> An exclusive London club, July 1st. Uh, what's the uh, latest cable report, uh, Briggs? They passed Cairo, sir. Cairo? Uh, not Cairo on the Nile, sir. Cairo on the Mississippi. Oh, quite. Extraordinary, isn't it, sir? A race that runs for days on end. Uh, most uh, extraordinary, Briggs. Uh, just why are they doing it, sir? Uh, well, Americans are always racing and competing. But why, sir? Why, uh, dash it all, Briggs, I... I don't know, but I do know I've got ten pounds wagered on the Natchez. Yes, sir. And I have ten shillings on the Robert E. Lee. St. Louis, shortly before noon, July 4th, 1870. For miles, both banks of the river are crowded with people. The hills are swarming with them, waiting to welcome the winner, whichever it may be. 
There she comes. Yeah. I can see her. It's the Natchez. Natchez, your granny wants to leave. You can tell by the way she rides. I don't see how you can tell anything, though. I'm scared she goes in the way. Oh, I've seen the lead too many times. Unless you can't fool me. Oh, I sure it's the lead. The Natchez is way behind. But she was passing up the last we heard. There's $25 of my money says it's the lead. Take it, stranger. Oh, I can't wait. You no, know, three days is a long time for race. Yes, sir. Hey. That's her whistle. Yes, sir. Only one on the river like it. The no, no, the lead. Come on, Captain Callum. We're waiting for you. It's the lead, all right. It is. It can be. I'm sorry to disappoint you, miss, but I know the lead's whistle anywhere. Yes, it's the lead. I can read her name now. Yes, I sir. saw uh, General Robert E. Lee himself once. Now, trouble with that 25, friend. Uh, Where's the matches? What happened to her? Well, uh, Three cheers for the Robert E. Lee. The most amazing history. The champion of champions. From New Orleans to St. Louis, in three days, 18 hours, and 14 minutes, that was the record of the Robert E. Lee. Racing became more than a mere contest between rival captains. Racing was responsible for the improvement of the Mississippi steamboat. Racing, rivalry, the spirit of competition brought better travel conditions, faster transportation of merchandise, progress, and advancement, just as the Oklahoma land race was instrumental in conquering a wilderness. Let us be thankful that this inherent quality remains an essential element in our country's lifeblood, for the spirit of progress helps make America a nation. The other night I found out again that the American determination to strive and succeed is very much alive today. I wish that all of you could have sat with me at the dinner table where I met a number of men whose daily work consists of the hardest sort of competition, competing with nature, using their brains and ingenuity to go nature one better. They were all research chemists. As they swapped experiences across the table, I was amazed to learn how far into the future their thinking extended and also how close they were to discovering new secrets of nature that will change and improve our lives tomorrow or next week or a year from now. One of those men told me the story of the part salt plays in chemistry. Well, you know, I hadn't the slightest notion of the number of useful things that DuPont makes for us out of salt. Come salt. I thought salt was just something you put on French fried potatoes and something that makes it easy to swim in the ocean. But these chemists told me they take salt as a basic raw material and make things as far apart as insecticides for farmers and cosmetics for beautiful women. Every time I pick up a salt shaker now, I remember that DuPont uses that same material to make products used in ethyl fluid for gasoline and Duprene, the marvelous synthetic rubber that beats nature's own rubber in many ways, even adhesives, cleaning fluids, and ingredients for dentifrices, all out of the stuff I throw over my left shoulder for luck. And salt is lucky after all. We're lucky to have it around, and we're lucky to have chemists who know what to do with it, how to turn it into many useful products. Another time, I'll tell you more of these fascinating adventures in the chemist's constant effort to provide better things for better living through chemistry. Wednesday evening at this same time, Frank Craven, well-known playwright, director, and popular star of stage and screen, will be our guest star when DuPont presents The Cavalcade of America. Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> 